guys, what's up? Aru. 4.1 is a hop, skip, and a jump away, and we still don't know why this guy is in jail. But we also don't know about Arlequino's true motive for being in Fontaine, as well as the problem that Fontaine faces every single day, along with some other things that may or may not cause a huge uproar within the fandom. In a good way, of course. So welcome to another video of POV, you're going to jail. This video will be focusing on everything I could find in the 4.1 livestream, Nouvellet, Forina, Arlequino and the twins, and Rizli within the story, the Meropede and the Research Institute's little secrets, and finally the prophecy that everyone knows will happen but don't know what to do. As always, timestamps below, let's get started. The person who sent us to look for child in the Meropede, as well as the person who sent child to the Meropede, is Udex Nouvellet, the confused, water-tasting connoisseur Chief Justice of Fontaine, who is the sole authority that presides over Fontaine's judicial system, as well as maintaining the unbiased and unassailable truth and idea of justice. His position as the Udex as well as his own personality keeps him at a certain distance from his acquaintances. No personal relationships and no real attachments for his sake and the sake of Fontaine. But he's pretty friendly with the Melusine, creating a law regarding their pronouns as actual people rather than animals or creatures. As well as commissioning a special detective force, the Marechusse Phantom, to help with intricate investigations and solve trials. The Melusine are personal friends of Nervilet and hence the reason for their Inclusion, even though they were created by Elinus, a dragon who once attacked Fontaine. Their keen sense of sight and sense of justice is also a reason for being targeted by criminals. I hazard a guess that this voice line here... Why should we trust this species from who knows where anyway? Melazines can't be trusted! That goes for Nervalette too! ...is based on that aspect of the Melazines, which I think is likely from Nervalette's own character quest, Deluvi's chapter. This is also apparent in the half Melazine, Sigvin, who wouldn't want Melusine wearing uniforms to be seen by those underwater, likely pointing to the Meropide and its lack of Melusine. Everyone in Fontaine seems to be fine with the Melusine being there, so this seemingly vocal minority is possibly from criminals that don't want to get caught by the Melusine. Yet the trailer shows many things that tell otherwise. Nervillette's role might change from a chief justice to becoming justice itself, possibly becoming the spokesperson of all of Fontaine. But what does that mean for those who deem Melusine and Nervillette untrustworthy? Is being born from a dragon of cosmic darkness a reason for bloodshed? to be the solution to their death? Or is this another twist of scenes and dialogue? The next dragon of pure water was said to be born a human, and Nervillet is more and becoming more of that reborn dragon. The rain, his behavior, the melusine, and his own temperament, to name some factors. Fontaine has enough reason not to trust Nervillet and Melusines, but those they distrust are also what keep Fontaine afloat amidst this cataclysmic descent. The greatest mascot of Fontaine is not seen much in this trailer, but that doesn't mean she won't appear in 4.1. As the goddess of justice, she should be included in as much of Fontaine's works as possible, yet we still know little from her and the previous Hydro Archon, Egeria. And the same can be said for the Oratress, which was created by air quotes, the Hydro Archon. To my understanding, here's what might have happened, but you need to put your lore hats on for this one. The previous Hydro Archon, Egeria, went to fight the Abyss 500 years ago, which led to her death and becoming the Amrita in Sumeru. This leaves Fontaine with no Archon and only Forina is left to take care of it. Hence the two different scenes in the 4.0 trailer. But in Fontaine, we have Egeria, the Hydro Archon, and her two daughters, Forina and Fosalor. Really cool. The voice of Forina here is not actually Forina, but Fosalor similar to Sumeru's story. This is an interesting twist since Oceanids can technically split and more or less create clones of themselves, of which Egeria is the previous Hydro Archon and was the noble navigator and an Oceanid, meaning Forina's sister Fosalor might be in one of those two places, put there by Egeria, or she sacrificed herself and ended up there. It is also said that Egeria created the first Oceanid that created all the other Oceanids from the quote-unquote first tier. And wouldn't you know, both Forina and Nouvellet 
possess a tear-shaped amulet, as well as the three tears on the Oratrice, Mechanique, the Annalise, Cardinal. In my previous videos, I've mentioned that there might be twins or maybe even more in Fontaine. And with the Erinese district being named after Erinese, which are three goddesses of vengeance on those who do any wrong, which is basically justice, as well as the mythology behind Egeria and the Fountain of Lucene, and finally the Ice Wind Suite with its three thrones. So we may have those exact three goddesses of vengeance and justice. I can understand Egeria and Farina being on one of the chairs, but the third one is interesting, yet kind of disturbing. Maybe the other sibling is Nouvellet and is charged with protecting Fontaine, while Farina is technically Fosalor's reverted form like Nahida in Sumeru. The Oratrice itself is made by the Hydro Archon and a voice speaks from within the core room. Similarly, we hear cries from what sounds like Forina in the Fountain of Lucene. There's also the variation of voices from Forina being scared and the scarier, calmer Forina and Nouvellet scene in the 4.1 trailer, either speaking to Nouvellet or a scared Forina. I can only guess that this second Forina is in the Oratrice when the Hydro Archon created it or is trapped somewhere in the Fountain of Lucene, put there by Egeria or she sacrificed herself and ended up there. Technically, we we almost could have had three Raiden Shoguns. The Raiden Shogun Puppet, A, and Makoto, which might be the same case here in Fontaine with Farina, Egeria, and possibly another Farina. These voices of Farina are likely for the Archon quest itself or Nouvellet's character quest. Either way, this means that we'll find the answer to the prophecy that all of Fontaine is trying to solve. Those words apply to both Forina and Nervilet. So we'll know soon enough if Forina will uphold her role as the God of Justice or if Nouvellet will be the spokesperson of Fontaine. Maybe even both. The father of all of Fontaine's children, Arlecchino, just kidding, I was being poetic, we don't know if all of Fontaine's hearth members are children or not. Anyway, Arlecchino, speaking with Nevelet and Forina, is the closest we could get to that awkward gathering with Zhongli and Venti. Arlecchino is known as the Knave, or the Harlequin in translation. He's also a Zanny and is the most proficient at her role as the trickster and more importantly, the devil and the servant and foreigner of the play. The dark colors on her design represent that she is a foreigner, yet she is from Fontaine. Arlecchino in the Commedia dell'Arte was born in the French border and had no real distinct characteristics. Yet this is what makes her most interesting, making her character very mysterious and exotic. Her red accent as well as her crossed eyes and red flare from the Overture teaser represents the devil and its cut horn in the unique Arlecchino mask. She even fits Arlecchino's late and dare I say abrupt entry into the Commedia, entering the House of Hearth and having a bit of a problem with the previous name, and then recently radically changing the Hearth's code from family sacrifice to self-worth and survival. The long noses of her hot I mean, cool, friends also reflects her slightly, representing the Zani's nose and their acromatic movements in the Commedia. Basically, she and her lackeys embody Arlecchino and the Zani's character to a T. Now back to 4.1, her main reason for meeting with Dorg and the mascot is to propose solutions for Fontaine's dilemma. Although many of those solutions were declined, Nouvellet ultimately agreed in the end. This plan is to infiltrate and get into the Meripede Fortress. We've heard from Linny that their informants and infiltrators posing as guards suddenly vanished, not to mention his siblings being missing as well. So Arlecchino's plan is likely to find something in the Meripede, of which is at the bottom of Fontaine's waters and is also where Child was incarcerated. Our mission is to infiltrate this prison and investigate certain incidents, as well as find Child's whereabouts while not getting caught snooping around. But why would we, as quote-unquote friends with Nouvellet, need to infiltrate the Meropede when it's part of Fontaine? Well, here's where you're wrong. And here's where you should also consider liking the video, subscribing if you haven't yet, and clicking on the bell for more content. Thank you. Now let's talk about the so-called utopia that is the Meropede. The Meropede is Fontaine's glorified deep water prison paradise for convicts and will be the main focus of 4.1's story. 
investigating a series of incidents as well as looking for a child within the fortress. It's worth mentioning that it isn't under Fontaine's normal jurisdiction, meaning the Meripede is a separate and autonomous entity existing in Fontaine, or under Fontaine. This is also the reason for us needing to have a fake crime to enter. There's also the fact that exiles convicted there somehow don't want to leave after they've served their sentence. Nouvellette calls it a gathering place for exiles, and the recent Duke Risley is likely the reason for all of this. Not to mention Siegvin, who is a Melusine with a special body that resembles a human. Risley created a mass of reforms and radically changed the fortress's system. There's also the lack of Melusine in the Meripede, where they should be needed the most. Not that it's a bad thing, but you have to consider what he did to calm down all these criminals. His worldly knowledge and experience as an underground pugilist is likely a huge factor in understanding the convicts' needs, which makes me curious as to how he rose to his position in the first place. Remember, the Meripede is also infamous for its corrupt network of gangs, and he was an underground pugilist so we don't know his actual background just yet. At the very bottom of the Meripede is also a mecha factory creating all sorts of mechanisms and is where convicts usually go for work. A repetitive and almost dull cycle of creating mechas in what we can see as an assembly line. You might wonder what happens to those uncooperative within the fortress. Not only can they get a one-on-one -on -one session with the duke as well as a firm meeting with the mecha and guards of the Meripede, someone also says that they have ways to dispose of remains and transform them to keep them in the fortress forever, which leads us to the incidents that we need to investigate, likely the incidents regarding disappearances of infiltrators mentioned by Linny. And these words are a hint to those disappearances. Remember the primordial water of the sea? Yeah, this scene here could also be the primordial waters, and Risley running from it is a point that he is with us, at least at that point. Every Fontanian can and will dissolve if they come into contact with this primordial water. And the Meripede, or at least someone in the Meripede, seems to be holding a huge amount of it. Likely one of the other gangs. So where's Child in all of this? We still have his vision and we still have no clue why he's guilty. Unless he's related to that primordial sea incident in 4.0, which is possibly connected to the mass of primordial water somewhere in the Meripede. But I'm more interested in his hydro vision not working. Whether it's a Numa OSHA reaction or the hydro sensitivity of Fontaine affecting it, it's still weird considering it's a vision that came from Celestia. We don't even know where he got this vision from. We also have Fremine, which may seem unrelated, but both Fremine and Child might have been experiencing the same phenomena of dreaming about the deepest depths of the sea and borderline drowning in their dreams. Yikes. So maybe this is a dream that Framinet also experienced. This scene here is probably the same massive quote-unquote whale that for some reason kept them from breathing in their dreams. We haven't seen Framinet's drowning scene in 4.0, unless I'm dumb, highly likely by the way, which was already shown twice over, along with, of course, Farina sitting on the throne. But it still hasn't happened, and we still have no clear meaning to it, so that could also be a reason he can't use it. There's also Skirk, his master, who we get more info about, as well as the abyss itself in 4.0. The title for chapter 3 is also an interesting call out to the abyss and the stars. So it could be foreshadowing that we'll see Skirk, unlikely, or the abyss, possibly, underneath the Meripede. The Fontaine Research Institute of Kinetic Energy Engineering, or Freaky for a lack of a better term, exploded some time ago due to a certain experiment led by the renowned scientist Edwin Eastinghouse. Researchers from the Research Institute are always pushing themselves to find the best solution for Fontaine's diluvian catastrophes. Not only for Fontaine, but for all of Tavat that may one day be covered earth and sky by this flood. Edwin Eastinghouse's study was focused on finding solutions to the flood prophecy and addressing the rising waterline crisis. And the main element used in his study was archaeum because of its massive potential for energy and power to quote-unquote shatter the shackles of the world, and was considered the key to opening the gate of salvation. With this scientific breakthrough in mind, he created the experimental field generator that counteracts the effects of gravity. But the results aren't always expected to be, which led to the incident. The devs seem to say that this was the main reason for Fontaine's explosion incident but there's likely more to know. And the experimental field generator is also located at the top of these floating cubes called allogravity condensed water bodies. 
The word allogravity is interesting to me since allogenes are vision holders that can attain godhood and go to Celestia. And Archeum, used to create the gravity generator, was said to be a key to opening the gate to salvation, likely salvation from the flood, but maybe Eastinghouse's study had a more ambitious notion that he didn't notice. Something as ambitious as becoming gods. How else could it possess the power to shatter the shackles of the world? Maybe it's related to the second one and the illusions that could break those same shackles. It's also a good reason for the Fatui to be there looking for intel. As the saying goes, the stars, the sky, it's all a gigantic hoax. A lie. All planned by Piero, who likely has more than just an inkling of knowledge about the stars. With what we currently know of Conria and the Sealy era from Sumeru's deserts, they already know of the sky and the Abyss's secrets. So we might find out more about the past than we'd like to know. From both Fontaine and Conria, and maybe even Sneznaya. So here's all my thoughts regarding the 4.1 livestream program. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Now comment below if you think Melusines will also become humans or not. And if you did, don't forget to leave a like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon for more content on this channel. I'm really hyped that we get to see Arlecchino in the flesh, as well as the Meropide and the Institute, both of which hold a lot of new and more importantly, old lore for us to just consume. Now I'm gonna have to catch up with that old world video. I really want to talk about the era of kings in Tevat. But that's all from me. I'll see you guys in the next video, yeah? Like, comment, if you enjoyed, subscribe, and hit the bell for more of my ramblings. And stay mad, theorists. Bye!